Hmm. Doesn't say that it started, but I guess it did. OK, yeah, great. So I think uh, we can start. Uh, so I just wanted to say welcome to everyone, and it's really nice to see so many of you here. Uh, this is the third in a series of um, um, webinars directed towards the Chinese life science market. And uh, we'll see if we have time to do some more um, during the spring. If you have any ideas for topics, uh, uh, I would be happy to receive them if you have some questions that you want to highlight, especially. So with that, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Tony and Marcus to start the presentation. Yeah, good. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> so um, uh, my name is Marcus, Marcus Dahlström, um, and um, uh, it's me and Tony from Nordic Match. Uh, here, we're always eager to talk about China um, and the topic of today, different strategic routes uh, uh, into, into the Chinese market. So just a short background. Um, uh, Tony will also introduce himself, but both of us come from SCB, um, and I did 16 years with SCB. Uh, different roles and um, uh, also spent almost six years living in Asia uh, before we started and found the Nordic Match in 2017. So um, Nordic Match, we are, uh, we call ourselves strategic uh, financial advisors. So we are um, uh, only working on uh, Sino Nordic uh, trade um, and investments. So Sino Nordic deals uh, between that's trades between Nord the Nordics and China. Um, I'm based in Stockholm. I'm right now in my home here in Bromma. I have my, uh, we have an office in, in the city as well. Um, but just a short background of what we do. We are um, uh, specializing on, on a couple of things, but the one part is M&A. We call us an M&A boutique um, between the Nordics and China. And we uh, a recent trend uh, that we will touch upon later on in the presentation is also uh, inbound M&As. We're working with quite a lot of inbound M&As uh, into China. Um, we work with um, mid cap and large cap companies um, and we are generalists. But with that said, we are working quite a lot with med tech uh, and a lot with industrial companies and also tech companies. Uh, the other part of Nordic Match is more, um, it's also strategic advisory. We also help with Chinese China business plans, um, but also these type of structures that we will discuss today um, uh, that is more towards uh, joint ventures, licensing, um, um, some distribution agreements, uh, and we help, we, we project lead um, these cases for our, uh, our, our clients. Um, okay, I'll, um, I'll let you introduce uh, yourself, uh, Tony. Tony is calling in from our head office in Shanghai. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony, and uh, I'm a Swedish uh, Chinese, uh, grew up in Stockholm and uh, worked together with uh, Marcus at SAB for many years. Um, I started my career at SAB Stockholm as a management trainee in 2012. And then uh, after two years, I was relocated to Shanghai office of SAB. Worked here for another four years before uh, founding Nordic Match together with Marcus. So I'm currently here based in Shanghai together with the execution team of almost 10 people. So very delighted to have the opportunity to, to speak today at Sweatcare's event. Thank you, Anna, for organizing this and uh, looking forward to this um, discussion. Great. Yeah. Uh, OK, good. I think we can then um, uh, kick off um, here. Um, so I can just run through briefly the agenda here. It's fairly simple. We have half an hour. Um, like I said, we don't want to be too technical into the strategic routes. Uh, if there's any questions, you can ask that in the forum afterwards. We have listened to Karl Mark and to Villanova as well. But we do a short recap of the China medtech market. I know, as Anna said, that you've been listening to this before. This is the third in a series. So we will not do too much Chinese uh, macro. <laughs> um, uh, and then we will go into some existing Nordic players and the strategic routes and then uh, some uh, um, conclusions. Uh, the Q and A will actually be after um, the presentations from the two uh, the two companies. Um, so okay, let's let's kick off. Yeah, 
I think uh, I'm sort of over the environment tech market. I think everyone um, knows probably a bit about um, how the market looks like, but I think it would still be interesting to just give you a breakdown. So first of all, um, China is probably the, the one of the largest tech market globally, uh, and it has been growing very, very fast during the past five to 10 years. And uh, currently we're we talking about a market size of, um, I mean, only between uh, 2014 to 2018, that went by uh, a quarter of a billion, I mean, 256 billion RMB to uh, almost uh, more than double, um, 530 billion by 2018. And it has been growing by around 20% every year. And uh, we, we expect that the market will continue to grow and exceed to 900 billion RMB by 2022. And you, you can also see that um, the health expenditure is growing at the same time, which also um, supporting the growing market size, which uh, you can also see that the, I mean, the, the country is spending around 7% on health healthcare every year. And you can also see that uh, because of the, the big uh, market uh, in China itself, um, there is also a growing amount of manufacturers. You can see there's uh, 16,000 of those um, medical device manufacturers today um, established in China, where um, you can divide them into uh, several segments, but you can see that uh, class two product, they have uh, 9,000, and then the second follow-up is a class one product, which has 6,000 uh, in China. And uh, you can also see that China today is the leading export nation for Swedish pharmaceuticals, which I think is a very interesting um, takeaway. The country represents around 16% of all Swedish pharmaceutical exports and also the eighth largest destination for medtech devices. Um, that also means that China will also um, grow in terms of importance for uh, Swedish um, medtech and healthcare companies. Uh, not only in the past, but also in the future. But if you look at the diagram in, to the left, you can see that if you break down the uh, 530 billion, you can see that the biggest, um, the lion's share of that is still um, relating to medical the, uh, equipment, which uh, Swedish companies are very, very good at. But then follow, follow that, it's the high value medical consumables, low value of medical consumables, and then last but not least, the, the in vitro diagnosis. So that is basically the, the breakdown of the uh, of the market. And then uh, we go to the, the enormous uh, uh, market, the country, and also why uh, the market is growing. So if you look at the, the map of China, you can see you can see that most of the, the com uh, companies, the med medical devices company that we talk about, 16,000 of them, they are actually located mostly in Zhejiang and Beijing provinces. Um, so Zhejiang, it's very close to Shanghai, which is here. And then Beijing is the capital of China, which is here. Um, those are typically uh, clusters together with um, Guangdong province. And Guangdong is famous for uh, producing hardware, and not only for medical, but also for electronics and so on and so forth. So I think that it's very uh, interesting to know if you're considering in establishing business in, in, in China uh, to consider those three regions. Um, and then to the right, I would like to say that the fundamental reason why um, met healthcare market is growing in China is because of the changing demographics in China, where you can see that that the, um, due to the historical reasons where, where, where China has a very, very high uh, birth rate during the um, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and now towards nine, uh, one child policy during the 80s, you can see a reverse pyramid in China where, where uh, we will see an enormous challenge in terms of uh, demographics um, the coming 30 years to come. Where, where China will have enormous amount of um, people above 60 years old. So the air elderly population is growing tremendously, uh, as you can see here. Um, and uh, that is basically um, pushing forward 
towards all kind of um, healthcare needs, such as hospital, medical devices, and um, healthcare services. And that will also be an enormous opportunity for Swedish companies and Nordic companies uh, in the future. Yep. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, you can take the next slide there. Yeah, the the changing landscape in in China and of course the elderly segment is has it's changing quite rapidly and then the, they have this demographical um, uh, problem at the moment and it's changed. The landscape keeps changing a lot. I mean, we've been working against the Chinese market for eight years now and uh, and uh, and um, when it comes to the I would say the the R and D um, uh, focusing right now and the the upgrade to, towards new technology has really kicked off the last five years. Uh, to mention uh, something that we see there as well as it's more common these days to move uh, R and D centers to to China from uh, uh, nor some Nordic countries and and also from other European countries. Um, 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 so I think. Um, it's a couple of things to highlight here. I mean, the the of course the spending um, uh, that's been rapidly in, in, increased here during the last two decades, but also the the huge um, the government support uh, programs. I mean, um, Jinping announced 2016 already that they need to um, um, they need to increase the, the governmental support, which they really have done. Uh, we will come back to that later on as well, um, what type of, of uh, I mean, there are uh, different grants um, uh, and on the technology side, the medtech side, um, it has opened up more uh, due to the new legislation as well. Um, Shanghai, we think is, is, is interesting, I mean, and, and, and the sub areas um, uh, around Shanghai, um, a lot of qualified um, um, workers, uh, good universities, um, and also strong um, governmental support. Um, the the patent side uh, is of course of, of interest is as well. Um, Forty percent of, of of the global total, um, and 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 double the size of of US. Um, that one could think is 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 a huge market for patents, um, and I think. One thing that uh, we are working with, I mean, uh, Carl Mark as well, that we'll be presenting today, but I mean, we are uh, in the cl clinical trial process. Um, uh, there are also have been, been steps um, to sort of ease the, uh, the approval of, of, um, of foreign medtech devices. Um, also, how you can allow data from, um, from clinical trials in, in other countries. Uh, to be part of the um, the um, um, NMPA registration, um, yeah. So that's that's the uh, R and D side. Um, I think we can go into the uh, mention some of the existing Nordic players. Yeah, and uh, I think those kind of companies are are, are very familiar to m m most of you guys, but. I would like to highlight them because of the, they have been in China for quite some time and been fairly successful. So first of all, for example, Nordisk since uh, 94, um, established their own business from the very beginning and uh, employs around 1,700 uh, employees in China already and have um, regional offices across China but also R&D and production facility. So, so for no, a company like Nordisk, who has been here for over 20 years, their strategy is really in China versus China, uh, not because of the, its cheap labor, but because of the growing market for, for um, diabetes uh, patients and growing uh, wealth um, trend in China where, where, where their product is more needed. Um, so, so for Nomi Nordic, this is a very important market, for example, and they have been positioned themselves um, over 20 years ago, basically. So they have a very, very long-term strategy for China. Um, Nomi uh, Nordic is basically a, a spin-off of uh, Nomi Nordic, and they, just like them, they they have also a very well presence in China. But what's interesting here is that they also um, do sales via Alibaba, which is the e-commerce platform, uh, which we think it's uh, rather uh, interesting to, to see 
but that can also be working out for healthcare companies in you know, Chinese e-commerce. So, so I think um, one of their, their, their executives in China has said that they want to become a front runner in providing um, biological solutions online as well as offline. And by partnering up with Alibaba, they would like to become get closer to the end clients and address the local needs faster and explore and explore new application opportunities. I think that is a very innovative way for Nordic companies to be so um, alert and so localized in their way of thinking. I mean, for no Novozymes themselves, they might not even have an e-commerce solution for, for the home market in, in the Nordics, but, but choose to do so in China. I think that, that is a very agile way that, that I think is worthwhile to lift up. Uh, third one is AstraZeneca. They have their global R&D center in China, AI innovation center, and also an investment fund together with a Chinese uh, investment bank um, with $1 billion uh, in funding, basically investing in future healthcare um, uh, opportunities in China. So I think um, that shows that um, they are already not only a, a big multinational player, but also a big uh, local player. They are today, I think, is the number one pharma company in China. Um, I mean, also comparing to Chinese players, which is, I think, it's a, been a very, very big um, um, success. And uh, yeah, which is, yeah, it's a very, very interesting. And Vitro Live, um, I think, in terms of uh, IVF, that is a very interesting area where uh, with the increasing wealth in China and uh, with that, um, that also goes that um, people will have kids uh, later in the, in the age. And also, uh, if you see the latest birth uh, rate data in China, you can see that people have less and less kids. Um, Although still in absolute numbers, still very high number, but 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 the number has dropped uh, significantly over the years. That also help a, co a, a company like Vitro Life business in China. So they have been in China for for many years, and uh, and uh, um, its Chinese market is is today the third largest market in the world, and in and it's uh, growing rapidly. So, so they have basically been doubling the turnover and continues growing, and they want to become a dominating um, player in the country. So I think that's also a very interesting trend to see. I mean, by capturing the latest trend uh, in China and applying uh, world leading technologies uh, into this market in China for China. Yep. Okay. Uh, good. Now we, we will get into the um, uh, the more uh, strategic routes uh, into China. Uh, the uh, we'll get into the fun part, uh, uh, as 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 we say, as financial advisors. <laughs> uh, we will uh, we have 15 minutes left. Um, I will spend some time on uh, discussing the various options here. This is an overview slide uh, that we use to present. Um, uh, we will. I will. We will do more deep dive of these. Uh, but I just to highlight um, uh, something on 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 each slide here. I mean the the licensing and distribution you probably know of. Um, I mean finding a distributor in China is 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 a pretty straight way into the market. Um, I think when it comes to the licensing side, um, there's there's um, th that that can also come with sort of a a minimum sales uh, requirement. Um, I think we can actually, this is good to have an overview. We included this uh, in the material also, so it will, it will be sent out uh, for the viewers to, the ones who are interested can, can more um, um, digest this, um, uh, this slide that sort of describes it uh, fairly simple. Um, but I think we can go into the next slide. Um, I will be dis describing more um, regarding um, the JV structures and, and, and why JV. So, uh, I mean, to start with, I think that uh, 
JVs in China has had a fairly bad uh, reputation. If you go back uh, 20 years, um, I mean, it's a it, it's a co-owned company in in China. Um, th th there's been problems on the on the legislative slide side, um, uh, copying um, and 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 uh, also uh, problems with IP. I think a lot of ha has happened on this on on this side the last five six years uh, new legislation that's passed and I think it's it's all about, about relationships and finding a good partner um, as, as, as as always and and uh, and a JV we normally say that a JV works well as long as as long as everybody makes money then then everybody's happy um, but it's 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 a quite common uh, phenomenon um, and and uh, we know uh, today I mean we've been working with quite a lot of, of JVs and JV setups that normally the, the Nordic companies are after um, I mean uh, not just local know-how but the whole network sales channels uh, distribution um, um, and and, uh, and um, opening up the market um, marketing is a quite big big uh, um, angle as well that we, we haven't really touched upon here but um, how, how to market a, a new product in the Chinese market for instance and when it comes to sales channels um, just to highlight as well it's I mean the e-commerce e side uh, is huge in China uh, they've come further than we have here especially on the B2B segment um, so there are various um, positive aspects about about um, uh, a JV structure. Um, normally, what we do um, for a JV structure is that we there is possibilities to own a, 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 a JV. Um, I mean, for a, a Nordic company, but we know we normally set up a a Hong Kong. Um, uh, Asia hub um, uh, for the companies and then a Wufi, uh, uh, um, a wholly foreign owned enterprise in, in China. And then you can do a JV direct in that company or uh, in a um, third company. So the JV uh, you, invests or, or owns 50% um, uh, minority or majority in the, in the JV. Um, um, I think uh, there are um, there are advantages setting up companies doing it that way as well via Hong Kong and via Wufi obviously to, to mitigate the risks also away from the the the, the mother company or the 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 um, AB the Aktie Bolag um, as well um, this is one way uh, I should say there are other uh, way that you can use um, different um, vehicles um, and 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 invest in the, in in the Chinese market as an, an SPV, for instance, um, EJV and 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 CJV. That's basically uh, is it going to be an equity um, JV, an equity investment, or or is it more a a um, a partnership? Um, uh, structure where you sort of uh, lean against each other's um, um, I mean for, for instance what I mentioned there uh, sales channels and distribution network and marketing comes from the Chinese side and, and the Swedish company provides the the technology and maybe you want to have local production as well um, um, there are Quite a lot happening um, on the uh, legislative side um, with the new foreign investment law. Uh, we will touch upon that, on that um, in a few slides as well. But we can go to the next slide. Um, th this looks very complex. <laughs> uh, we, we we try and, and do this in a simple way, but it's 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 quite difficult to to show. But it's. It's uh, it's also a good overview of the uh, the Nordic company. Uh, in this case, we have a, um, a listed uh, Chinese company as a as a partner, and you have the technology transfer, uh, the patent and the band uh, and and the brands then um, still owned by the Nordic company. That can also be transferred to the JV, but when it comes to the um, the uh, patents, for instance, that's normally kept, uh, and the IP can be kept with the mother company as well. That depends. Um, and, and as you can see here, it's it's an investment uh, via the, the SPV uh, set up by the Chinese company, and uh, and they are bringing distribution and sales to the to the table as well as um, a capital um, injection. Um, the exclusivity is something that we discuss a lot, and of course majority contra minority. Um, I mean. 
Chinese uh, normally normally uh, would want a majority holding um, in the JV, but there are other circumstances where they don't need to have a JV, but uh, the uh, majority it can also be uh, a 50-50 uh, setup. Um, uh, and of course, also the, the governmental support um, is uh, more openly um, distributed to this to a local company than if you are a pure foreign company, then you can not take part uh, of the, uh, the grants and um, subsidies that's, that's available for a few of these companies. Um, also, there can be a clawback on the um, um, sort of um, um, uh, exclusivity in China if the demands are not met, um, etc. That's more difficult if you have a, um, a um, capital injection and you have a um, um, co-owned company, but there are parameters that you can set up um, that they must fulfill when you go into the agreement and into the term sheet negotiations. Um, let's do um, a bit more. Uh, we do one. We, we can just highlight the next slide is there also for um, more uh, a post read material after this presentation. But I can just highlight the, the bottom part there. Uh, the consultancy setup we don't need to discuss, but but the licensor. I think this is the um, uh, important uh, part uh, as well. How you sort of uh, you provide an, an exclusive license and and the right to use um, for the the Chinese market. Um, and when it comes to distribution and and sort of sales, you can also have. It could be that the the mainland Chinese partner is has their own network, but that could also be, uh, you can also assign more uh, distributors to, um, to, um, uh, for, to the Chinese market, and that normally comes via the, the Chinese company. Uh, provide a purchase option of the technology, yes, uh, we see that as well, um, sort of a buyout clause, um, and also that they pay back royalty fee uh, to the, um, uh, the, the mother company and also a, uh, a service fee um, for uh, yeah the technical support. Um, um, okay, um, I think we can go into. Um, uh, we will touch upon a few other uh, angles as well. Uh, we're, we're, we're greenfield, of course, as well. And so Tony will mention that um, uh, briefly. Yeah. I think. Um um, one reflection uh, of being here um, for not too long time. I've been here uh, since 2012, so uh, over eight years, I would say. And I think what's different um, living here compared to Sweden, I would say that uh, things happen in a very, very fast pace in China. So even, I mean, if I just compare how things works 10 years ago when I was here, I'm Compared to now, I think uh, China is a different country. So, so I think it's very important to keep that in mind when when when, when we make strategic decisions because um, because um, it, it it might be very different, not always, but but it could be. So so um, to, I think Greenfield has historically been been the main goal uh, to go strategy companies in across all industry, including healthcare. So right. for example, for Novo Nordisk, they put in a 50 million US investment in uh, 94, opening up the, 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 the plant in, in Northern China. Um, and uh, that is still a way, good way for, for many Nordic companies to go. Um, that, that, that means that you have full control how things goes. And uh, considering that um, the China is trying to increase their transparency in terms of um, making um, new business a little bit easier to, to do. Um, I think um, Greenfield is continue to uh, be a favorable um, way and probably easier today compared to years ago. And, and they are also trying to do so by, by enforcing new reforms to increase the efficiency uh, and provide tax cuts uh, for, for, for international companies, um, trying to cut the tariff and also some uh, technical barriers for foreign investors to enter into China. Um, so I think in that sense, 
uh, together with the fact that as a production base with the Chinese um, staffs being more better and better educated, many with um, like uh, diplomas from uh, university abroad. And I think um, with the increasing competency, it's also easier to establish a manufacturing base here uh, without uh, being afraid that it's uh, you always need to send a lot of people all over to get them up and running. I mean, obviously, in the beginning, I think it's needed, but but but, but in the longer run, I would say uh, Chinese uh, staff, if they are well trained, they are usually uh, fairly uh, fairly good. So this uh, a bit about the greenfield. Uh, in terms of partnership, I think uh, Marcus has talked um, around it uh, before. And uh, compared to Greenfield, I would say distribution licensing is definitely a light, lighter version, uh, where distribution is probably basically basically dipping your toes and uh, into the Chinese market. And I think it's a relatively simple way to fill the market and see if your product has a good fit in China. Uh, that goes for for any kind of products really. And uh, in, within a relatively short time, you can you. As long as you find a good partner, uh, you will quickly see if your product has is is uh, attractive in the market. So we all take to um, The key difference between distributing, uh, setting up the distribution agreements in China compared to other countries is that uh, you need to work not necessarily only with one, but also you can work with uh, several distributors. Considering that China, um, as a as a country, is basically of the size of a Europe, so I think one distributor doesn't necessarily cover the whole China per se. Same goes like, like you have one distributor for whole Europe. Um, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, for example, in tier one city like Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, with um, a population of over 20 million people in each of them, is probably very, very different from a rural area with uh, hundreds, thousands of uh, people in outskirts of the, the country. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, in terms of licensing, I would say that it's probably the world's fastest growing market, growing by percent annually. So, so what you can do is basically that you can uh, combine a technology transfer with an investment in, into a joint venture through the Wufi. And uh, in order, yeah, in order to, to, to make it work. And uh, no matter of the size of the business, all companies in mainland and need to apply for the business license with the yeah with the Chinese government and uh, yeah so so this is a I would say it's between the greenfield and distribution licensing is probably the middle way um, and then in terms of merger acquisitions which I think is that it's the most sorry uh, I think we are going over time here now. Uh, I don't know, Anna. Do we should we jump into? I think, yeah. Let's we can skip the conclusion and and uh, Tony, you can take this the merger and acquisition side. That's quite uh, interesting and and, uh, and 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 a good way into China as well. And then we go directly to the companies. Yeah, I think um, since we are based here, we we meet a lot of uh, Nordic companies with significant operations. Uh, certainly, many uh, Nordic. Uh, meta companies. So many of them with uh, sales production in China, they are seeing that um, because of COVID, the Chinese market has been growing even faster because the recovery of COVID has been, been much better in China compared to the rest of the world. So so year year growth, China has definitely been a highlight for many multinational companies. So with that, uh, it means that more investment will be poured in from multinational companies in China. So now, uh, with a low liquidity, uh, cost of liquidity in the Europe, 
many would say, how can I grow fast in China? So, so basically, you have two routes to go if you want to grow. Uh, one is by Greenfield, the other one is by MAA. And despite the, the benefits I earlier mentioned, I think inbound MAA route, you can quickly ramp up a, a manufacturing site and most importantly, the clients and the products you might need uh, in China, you know, fairly uh, quick way compared to doing the greenfield that might take two or three or maybe even longer time to, to establish fully. So that uh, Tony, is sorry, that uh, I think have. your connection is a little bit bad. So maybe if you turn off your uh, camera, because it's lagging a little bit, so maybe that would help if you do that for a bit. OK, is it better now? I think so. OK, good. So yeah, I think uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, because of the, the, the COVID and the Chinese market is performing better and with the demographic changes in China, I think um, there is a more interest for Nordic companies or multinationals to consider to expand into China via um, uh, inbound MA strategy. Yeah, I think um, that's about it. Yeah, um, good. I think we skipped the conclusion, Anna, and um, and 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 listen to some live cases uh, instead. We 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 will share our material and, and our contact details um, uh, in 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 the material as well. Okay. Great, that's fine. Um, thank you for that, uh, Tony and Marcus. And then we move on to Marielle from Calmark, CFO at Calmark, to give us some insights in about your journey into China. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate that I could join this uh, session today. So thank you, Marcus and Tony also for this. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Now, can you all see? Yes. OK, excellent. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Karl Mike uh, today uh, and where we uh, come from and where we're going. <laughs> so uh, first of all, uh, Karl Mike is a company who's focusing on uh, diagnostics for newborns. Uh, the company started off uh, in 2007. And uh, uh, we started out as a research and development uh, company uh, specializing in, uh, in research on uh, a marker called LDH. Uh, now we are entering a new era. We're changing, going into a more commercial production and sales company and leaving uh, the main R&D uh, direction um, after us. So uh, we want to become the, the global leader in uh, point of care diagnostics for newborns. Uh, so in the long term, we want to offer all relevant tests uh, during the, the newborn's first time in life. I think that's a, quite a nice uh, ambition, I would say. So uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Marielle Boss. I work as a CFO of Karl Mack, as I said. I have previous experience from uh, the IT industry. Uh, having been the CFO for Euler Packard Enterprise for a couple of years, also working in Tieto and Every. Uh, I have also been working in, in AGA uh, with the healthcare oxygen area, uh, so medical uh, medtech as well. Uh, and I previously also have been working at Baxter uh, Medical, so I have quite a lot of uh, medtech uh, in my portfolio. OK, so looking at this, we now see our products. This is uh, how it looks like. We have an analyzer uh, and uh, we have test cassettes that we put into the analyzer, depending on the, the marker that will be analyzed. And um, uh, we have two portfolios, one for the newborns and one actually for the COVID-19. So um, you can see the markers that we're working on here too. 
in the in the slide we have bilirubin glucose or ldh uh, and the ldh can also then be uh, used uh, for a triage uh, analysis at the hospitals for covid-19 no? uh, okay so moving onwards uh, what does it actually do or well, why even do we do this um, as you can see from the picture here, it, it can take more than than uh, uh, three hours to get a, a result uh, from the blood samples at the hospitals using the, the traditional technology, uh, the labs. Uh, and uh, um, by using our product then, uh, which is actually a point of care, being uh, doing the testing where the baby is, it takes approximately three minutes to get a, a response or uh, an analysis made. So quite efficient, I would say. Huh? Uh, of course, the same goes for for COVID-19 testing. Uh, so uh, the main reason for doing uh, the COVID-19 is that we have, uh, there is a possibility to see if a patient needs intensive care or can manage without it. Uh, so this is actually a part of then the decision making process at the hospital. <clears throat> so this is actually supporting a, the trial si situation. And this is outside of our uh, core business. Um, however, since we did have quite a substantial research on the LDH, uh, this was possible then to, to, to use or to leverage upon. Uh, so that's why. Okay, so moving ahead a little bit and into the topic of the day, I would say. So we have um, we have previously uh, had an idea in the company to enter the Chinese market, not only because of of the uh, the size and the the potential of the market, but also because of we uh, our CEO has the background as being uh, or having launched products uh, in China previously or actually on a global basis, but um, China. So uh, we chose China as more directing the efforts to one large market because being on several markets, large markets at the same time would not be of benefit for us. So we chose China and uh, this, uh, uh, these companies in China, they will also serve as a a hub uh, for expansion to other countries in the area. Mm. Uh, so the initial contact, I think that was taken like end of 19, start of 20. Uh, we paused the discussion a little bit because we wanted to have our uh, Billy Rubin product uh, uh, marked and before doing anything else. Uh, and by July, we have uh, signed the agreement with Nordic Match and initiated the project then. Uh, well, I think uh, from a point of view of where we stand now, uh, we have actually then started our two companies, one in Hong Kong and one in mainland China. <coughs> we have selected our office premises. Uh, we've had uh, very uh, good discussions with the local government and uh, the, the iCampus. Uh, so we have had a lot of good discussions and also uh, regarding uh, subsidies uh, or um, alike benefits. Uh, so uh, I think that is more, more or less it. Where we are currently is that we have uh, also completed our uh, IM, our uh, memorandum. So we uh, stand uh, ready now for for meeting investors uh, and doing that kind of work then. So this is very short and brief from Carl Mack. Okay, thank you, Marielle. So you're, um, so, so you, this is Greenfield then. That's the strategy you have chosen. You're starting from scratch, so to speak. Yes, we're starting from, from scratch, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we can come back to that, but you also have a timeline there. Um, I think that could be interesting to just show uh, Marielle as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Uh, and also um, a little bit background. I mean, you you choose to enter China fairly quickly uh, or early in in the process. I mean, you you didn't even have CE marking <laughs> uh, and 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 a ready product. Maybe you can just mention uh, something about that as well. Well, um, we actually did have a CE mark product oh, uh, by by April. Yeah. Uh, so we initiated the our cooperation then just after that one in in July then. Uh, but I mean, in terms mm -hmm. of the decision process, when to enter enter China at the time, you didn't even have a you did not have the red product. Hey. Uh, well, when it comes to to China, I think uh, it's very much about timing, of course. Huh? But uh, looking at China, it's a, a very good market uh, for obvious reasons. This is one uh, one focus for us then. In terms of number of newborns, absolutely. I mean, in, in the last year we had, I think I saw a number of 16.2 million newborns mm -hmm. in 2020. So this is, of course, a substantial market. Yeah. Um, so um, I think we are not up and running as of yet. We need to have the registration and everything uh, done, um, but it will take at least another year before everything is uh, is uh, uh, in operations. So um, I think it was a, a good uh, timing uh, to to enter uh, at this point uh, of the company, having one product uh, uh, up and running, and then the other ones coming uh, soon ahead now. Maybe just a quick question before we let uh, Mohammed enter. Uh, is your product a class two product? What does that mean? Uh, so the the classification in the regulatory system that depends on how much uh, clinical trials and so on you need. Mm. We will perform a clinical trial uh, on 200 babies coming up. Mm. So we're in that that kind of process. So I would guess yes to that question. Yes, yeah, it is. OK, great. All right. Thank you so much, Marielle. And Thank then you. Uh, we'll have some more questions hopefully at the end. But uh, Mohammed, uh, CEO of Vironova, please join us. Well, you're here, but. Great. There you are. One second. So yeah. after all these sure. months of working digitally, <laughs> let's see what we can do. Okay. So good. the first thing I heard from uh, Marielle was uh, timing. So I have to start by introducing myself. I'm a virologist. So the timing is is good. And let me now share my. Do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Now. Okay. Great. Uh, yes. So, yes. So hello everybody. Thank you very much. I'm here to share my uh, experiences on entering the China mar Chinese market. My name is Mohammed. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Vironova. My background is uh, I'm a researcher in medicine, chemistry, biology, and I spent more than 10 years doing research on viruses. So uh, viruses, that's the timing. Thank you, Marielle. <clears throat> so I spent uh, two, three months in China during 2019 uh, as a uh, on-site market research, establishing uh, connections, meeting with investors, meeting customers and local government. And I'm coming more back to that about the strategy of entering. So what we do at Vironova, we work with a very advanced form of microscopy called electron microscopy uh, to look at virus particles. Uh, so this is how it looked like if you have a, a virus that you look at in an electron microscope. This is not a, a patient because then he would be stone dead. Just to illustrate um, what it looks like. And the problem with having images as uh, data in medical research or in the industry, it's not uh, objective. It's open to interpretation. So Vironova, we are a tech company. We do image analysis software to basically extract information from images. And what we're looking at are virus particles. Just going to illustrate this short with a movie. If you are a producer of vaccines, for example, what we do, we take out a small sample of the vaccine, put it on a small copper grid, put it into the microscope, and then our software automates the microscope to magnify and search for virus particles. 
once it finds the virus particle, we can count how many they are, measure their size, look if they are broken or intact, if there's aggregation in the sample. And basically the application is uh, quality control when developing and producing vaccines. Short about that, actually the, the main use of viruses is gene therapy. You use a virus to insert a gene or a drug, and a vaccine is just to take a virus, make it a little bit nicer before you give it to the patient. Just illustrations here. Down left, if you're working with a gene therapy, you want to see if the small virus particles are empty or full. To the right, you want to measure their size and optimize their size so that they perform better in the patient. I'm running through this a little bit quickly too. So what we do with our uh, customers, we help them with this sample preparation. There's a lot of documentation. So if you do this in China, of course, it needs to be in Chinese. So we have many Chinese employees right now. Then it's about image acquisition. That's the core of Vironova's product offering that we automate it. And the customer value lies in the analyzed data. And we help the customer to write reports. Now, our main markets has been so far Europe and US. So we work with the EMEA and the FDA and our report, our reporting is for the customer to file for approval to produce and market and sell a vaccine on a certain market. So there is still some work for us to do there when we enter the Chinese market. So when we um, enter China, it's very important to start with a service offering to help them to set up this process. And the service offering is we can sell the Minitem, our product, which is also a CE uh, label. The software as a standalone, like a Photoshop or microscopist. And here we can target the academia first. So uh, R&D collaborations and using the R&D collaborations that are already in place, for example, between the Karolinska Institute and several medical universities in China is important. Then in 2019, we had a strategic partnership and an investor with Hitachi in um, Vinova, and we have just finalized and made a new product. And with the, that product, we have the scalability to enter a huge market like uh, China. Coming back to that very soon. Just for the market, we work with universities, academia, uh, small and medium sized companies who work in vaccines and gene therapy, uh, especially producers of viral vectors. And we have 15 of the 20 biggest pharma companies uh, as customers already. And one strategy is to follow them and to partner with them when we enter the Chinese market. And uh, Tony already uh, stressed the fact that AstraZeneca has been around in China for a very, very long time and is very well established in China. And that's uh, helpful for all Swedish companies. As uh, I, I think you pointed out that they have started a big innovation center there uh, as well. So to uh, why I'm here, Sweden, we're very good at innovation. I represent a high tech company. We work with uh, both technology, software, artificial intelligence, image analysis and medicine. Um, yeah, virology, vaccines, uh, a, a big market already and becoming very, very much bigger now and, and growing. But Sweden, we don't have a big market internally, so we are used to go out in the world to export and China. What China has got is a huge market, really, really huge market. I think you also um, said that in the introduction. And China, besides being a big market, is also spending a lot of money on R&D. It's more than $500 billion. I think it's uh, as much as US uh, now. They are, they are the two ones investing most in, in R&D. So the important things here, for example, when we started Vironova, we were very, uh, we were, I had one leg in the acad academia or one foot and I started the company. And here in Sweden, we have a, a very good government support for entrepreneurs or how to commercialize science. So I, I use that, all the Vinova money to develop the software. And then we use European funds, EU grants to fund um, uh, product development, uh, launching Minitem, the world's first desktop electron microscope. And this is very, very interesting when it comes to China. Part of entering the Chinese market, I think, is being able to interact with local government. There's a huge support opportunity there, both for grants and support to establish, have offices, build labs, 
and also to collaborate when it comes to R&D between yourself here in Sweden or a Swedish university and a Chinese counterpart. And I think it's quite important, although I'm a scientist uh, or a businessman, it's good to know the, uh, and be able to play the political game as well. So the fact that Sweden was the first Western country to establish um, diplomatic relations with China in the 19, in 1950 is good to know. <laughs> it's good to know that uh, uh, the king was there in 2006 and that Hu Yintao came back to Sweden the year after to when this ship, Gothenburg, uh, you know, sailed from Sweden to China, and then from China to Sweden, to be able to talk about those things. Um, that's also important when it comes to business in China as anywhere else in the world. Business is about establishing relationships. So um, establishing relationships is something that there are good um, organizations and companies and people who can help you out. And some are here uh, today. I can recommend talking to Marcus and Tony, go to our Swedish embassy, Business Sweden, and just to network and try to find out and share problems and questions with other Swedish companies who are uh, entering the Chinese market. You're not alone when it comes to these things. And then a uh, second thing that I would recommend always when entering a huge market like this is you need a, a friend or a partner when doing it. So we've been working hard on uh, finding uh, customers, first of all, and we have customers on the service side. We have employees, we have both in R&D, we have microscopists, and we have our investor relationship, uh, investor relation person who speaks Chinese, knows China, and that's also very important before uh, entering China. And the final conclusion is, like uh, Marcus also pointed out, in order to really establish yourself in China, you have to have an office, a local office. And if you want to have investors, you really do have to show your strategy for China, your establishment in China, usually by hiring people locally, establishing an office and starting to sell. And I think uh, I, I'll, I'll stop there actually to, uh, I know time is running out, so. Uh, Mohammed, do you just want to uh, mention something about? I mean, you've been uh, Vinova is a very interesting company. Now you're 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 taking one step further in China. You established there as well, but you also did. Uh, you have met with uh, hundreds of investors, Chinese investors, um, uh, raising capital there. What do you think about the? the does any any anything separate them from other investors? And what do you think about the decision making process? And uh, are they fast, or does it take more time? Or or what, what is your reflection there? Well, my my reflection is that um, if you want an investment in your Swedish company, you really have to be selective, because then you need a, need a Chinese investor with a dollar fund or a euro fund, and that has been very problematic. I think if you want to raise capital in China, the, the way to go is to raise for establishing yourself in China, setting up a JV, like you explained. And, and also at the same time, don't forget the government support you can get once you do it. So a sales office, a sales representative, someone on site, that was, that's probably uh, the thing that is needed to get an investment from a Chinese investor. We do have um, several discussions ongoing, and uh, I hope now when the when the world opens up again, <laughs> we might be able to to finalize something there. In end of 2019, what ha what happened is our partnership with Hitachi. So now we're working a lot with Japan, and and uh, so the, and the next step is uh, China, of course, still. So we just want to wait to be able to travel again. Mm. Great. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, that was some good uh, tips and tricks on what to think about when entering the China market. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, Mikael Persson wants to um, know what the main issues are that determine how and when to enter the Chinese market. Uh, Marielle, you talked about timing um, because you just saw that uh, you that the market was large and you you wanted to start tapping into that or was there any other aspects that you looked into? No, but I think uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, actually about timing, to be honest. We had our first product, uh, C-Mart, 
And given the fact that this is a process that does take time, it's uh, really about uh, timing. So uh, the project is supposed to take a year and a half. And given that fact, it's uh, it's time to act. Huh? Mm. Okay, so and rather not, not wait, just go for it. Yeah. No, yeah I, depending I, on I, the strategy, the... of course, yeah, that you have. Mm. Good, I can just add on that then as well. I think that's a, a, a question we get uh, fairly often here. Um, and I think it's, it's a couple of things here. I mean, first of all, we meet quite a lot of companies that, you know, I can think are maybe too uh, opportunistic. <laughs> it's, it's good to be opportunistic about the market, but you need to, uh, you need to spend time on the, uh, on a China, China business plan, uh, either in, if you do it in-house or, or you do it together with us, uh, we need, you know, um, the companies to do this seriously and, and also have a point of contact uh, that we can um, access all the time. I mean, for Mar Marielle and, and, and Anna, the CEO of Karlmark, they know that, you know, it's, it's quite a lot of dialogues going on uh, with our team in China as well. So not being prepared, uh, I would say you have to be prepared. Uh, of course, you need a budget um, for this uh, as well. So time and, and money. Um, and and uh, and things will happen um, along the way. Uh, China is getting better. Uh, we've been we've been talking about you know a lot of the the advantages with the Chinese market, but China is China. It's a lot of uh, you know uh, things that change rapidly. Uh, right right now they have too much uh, dollar funds in the system, for instance. Um, you know it's, uh, they, they are controlling the the flow of uh, of, of of funding uh, as well. So. It, it takes time um, and, and, and the question how and when, I would say we don't work with startups. I mean, start, Karl Mark is a startup, but, but I mean, for them, they have, first of all, an, an, an interest in, in ownership structure. Um, they are fairly well capitalized and, and they've taken this step, uh, you know, uh, to do it actively. And, and it, it's a board decision as well. It's well anchored within the company. And we also have the situation that our CEO has previous experience of launching products in China. So we have quite a good uh, starting point, I would say, uh, with good experience. And I think it's about leveraging on, on the, the package that you have. Mm. Uh, yeah. And Mohammed, do you have anything to add on timing? Well, um, I think looking at from what we did in 2019 and our next step, I think to to start to sell first and try to sell your product and service first before even talk, talking to an investor or a partner is a good thing to get to know your Chinese customer because now it's really interesting after having traveled around in China, we get we have Chinese companies contacting us. I hope that's a result of uh, our um, marketing activities, but it's also the fact that Chinese companies and younger Chinese companies are very active now and becoming very international and, and going out searching the internet, looking for companies and contacting them spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's very good too. And have you done yes. anything in specific to, to market yourselves in the Chinese market? Yeah, yeah. Now, now we have customers, so it's mm -hmm. always okay. selling to big Chinese companies, it's like mm -hmm. selling to any big company internationally. That takes a long time before you get mm -hmm. in. SMEs, smaller size companies, are more the early adopters. Okay. So for us, it's also to follow the maturity of the market. Uh, when we started there, there were not so many Chinese companies focusing on gene therapy. Now with this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's a lot of focus on vaccines. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a good opportunity now to, to continue the dialogues. And, but it uh, takes time. It takes yeah. time. It takes a lot of time. So you have to be patient <laughs> in business. Mm. And, and 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 also something to add there, Mohammed, to fill in. I mean, why we don't work with you know uh, seed companies. I mean, really early stage is also what 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 you mentioned there. I mean, proof of concept is super important when going to China. So um, uh, I mean, of course they can get in in, a, in in an early stage, but they prefer to have proof of concept in. The Nordics in Europe, uh, the US, and and preferably China. You know that they the, the the product is there, and somebody else has has tested it, or or, or it's available uh, in the market. Yeah. 
OK, so we have a second question. Uh, what are the main hurdles to overcome when entering the fast changing Chinese market and uh, your first hand experience? What has been most difficult? Well, I, I talking about Carmack then, I think the administration would have been a huge hurdle uh, if we hadn't had uh, the support from Nordic Match. Mm. Uh, I think that is uh, is really, really important to to get a good support on that one. So but, um, otherwise, it administration, you mean like all the setting up the companies like and uh, not to mention the, the bank account set up. Mm -hmm. I mean, now during the, the pandemic, at least it's been uh, quite challenging traveling. And uh, so this is something that Nordic Batch has actually succeeded in, in arranging. So we uh, we didn't need to in this in this phase to travel. So that was really, uh, really appreciated, I would say. Uh, so administration, absolutely, um, I would say. Um, yeah, not having the right network uh, is also one one uh, thing. I, I think uh, the the fact that we have the the I campus and the relationship there is actually uh, uh, also um, much to to thank Nordic Match because they did a a, a survey. Um, where to put the premises and uh, really traveling around mm -hmm. and looking. So uh, doing that local uh, search, uh, I think that's also uh, a challenging thing for us to do. Yeah. And Mohammed, what do you say about the main hurdles? Well, hurdle or hurdle, but the language is different. <laughs> so yeah. that's the challenge. You need to have the material in Chinese, although you have it in, in English and you have to be able to, yeah, you must have someone who speaks Chinese with you mm -hmm. all the time. That's important, I think. And also in the follow up discussions, it's more, even more important to have someone who speaks Chinese rather than English. Yeah. Um, yeah, otherwise I agree with uh, what Marielle said as well. But uh, also, uh, Marcus said that we need a, a strategy. And I mean, if, if your board and investors and, and the management, they should be focused and you should have a clear picture about what you're going to do. That That's quite important always in a, in a company. Yeah. So uh, is it a big step to go from a CE mark product to an approved product in China? Oh, that's the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a huge thing. We have worked a lot with uh, IP protection in China lately, mm -hmm. a lot, and uh, that's improving very, very rapidly right now. But it has been a problem actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and once again, it's mainly the language thing and the legal system thing is different, and it's up to us to adapt. Because as for any other country, you have to learn how how their legal system and apply in their language and have a local uh, lawyer. That's the same for the bank. You need a local bank to establish mm -hmm. a relationship. And that's also takes some time before you um, understand it. Yeah, and um, the last um, webinar that we had in uh, February was about regulatory issues and standards in this in the Chinese markets and uh, the the recording is on the Swedish YouTube site, so you can look for that and you'll find some more information about uh, the regulatory process. Uh, I think that and we have a great benefit there uh, being Swedish, the Swedish uh, Black Mess Racket, so uh, EMEA and FDA, we are quite uh, accepted globally, internationally, and that, that really helps a lot too. If you have a Swedish or European or American approval, that helps a lot. Good. So one more question. Can you act as a distributor in China uh, of medical equipment if you're a woofie in China? Do you need a joint venture? So regarding the the uh, the WUFI, I mean, that is a limited, um, uh, it's, it's an uh, LLC, uh, LLC uh, limited liability company. Uh, that is controlled by a uh, by foreign owner. Um, so why they 
started with this uh, in the past is that they uh, is to uh, encourage these kind of activities, manufacturing and and uh, you know export oriented, and uh, and uh, and um, the uh, on the advanced technology side. So I think it's possible. Uh, you can do that uh, now as well. That we mentioned the old. Um, uh, FIA structure um, that's now has been um, uh, the foreign invested enterprises is now on the, the new legislation that's called foreign investment law. So they have opened up for those type of, of, um, uh, of um, rights uh, in the Chinese market, but it's more difficult. It's much, much more difficult to, um, to, to be approved as a distributor if you are doing it on your own rather than in a JV structure where you have a Chinese, uh, you are backed by a Chinese investor. We we didn't touch upon that, that as much as, I mean, but Mohammed mentioned it as well. I mean, it, it's the, the relationship is one thing, but also the the government contacts is important uh, for the, uh, the investor that you take in, that they are well um, uh, accepted and that they have local government contacts, uh, I would say, to help with these, these approvals. Um, one comment there, and my name is Andrea from Business Sweden, uh, based in Asia Pacific, previously in China. Hey, Jan. Hey. Um, so, hello. So I think one thing regarding that, normally you do use a CF NMPA agent and they are Chinese and the majority of Swedish companies do apply for the approval through the agent and through their Swedish legal entity. So it's not required to be a joint venture. I think also joint venture is a very large topic. And as we know, being based in China, that almost 90% of all joint ventures fail. So it's very, very, you know, you need to take that decision with, uh, with cause. So uh, doing it through a WUFI is absolutely possible or even actually applying through your Swedish legal entity. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I mean, it's it's the statistics there are. Uh, I, I think it's actually it's not as high as as, as ninety percent, but it's it, it's lower now. But it's the same thing with M and A's. I mean, I've been working with M and A's for uh, thirteen years, and a lot of the M and A's fail as well. It depends how you you see it as a failure as well. I mean, looking at what's going on in other markets. Take um, you know, uh, we take a company like um, um, SKF. Uh, you know, they have seven or eight JVs uh, that's been fairly poor uh, at the moment. So there I can agree. I think four of those JVs, they are planning to, to buy out uh, now due to the foreign investment law. Now they can own majority in, uh, in, uh, in these companies. So yes, of course, you can also use a JV into the market. But I mean, for us, we are as open with JV as we are to inbound uh, m and It's about growing and, 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 and taking up as a fast track as possible into the Chinese market. Obviously, the, the best and long term alternative for, for a company that wants to benefit from the, the growth in the Chinese market would be to establish themselves uh, in the market. But it's, it's, it's a bigger hurdle and it's, 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 um, it, it takes even more, more time and, and, and effort, I would say, without the chi Chinese, um, uh, Chinese partner. But it's, 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 I mean, for sure possible. And, and we see that as well. Mm. Great. So uh, I think we've run out of questions. Uh, unless no one else, no? So I just made some uh, short uh, notes here. So I have you have to have a proof of concept. You need time and money. You need the knowledge, a network. You need language competence, a local partner, but perhaps most importantly, a plan. So I think uh, with that we will end today. And um, yeah, thanks for sharing uh, and. Uh, letting us know more about the Chinese market. And if you're if you have any ideas for for upcoming webinars, let me know. I have some ideas of my own. I just don't have the time, I think, to develop them further. OK, great. Thank you so much, Anna. And yeah. thanks for mentioning this. And and if anybody has questions, please get back to me and me and uh, uh, me and Tony. Super, and I will share the slides of uh, of uh, Marcus and Tony and Marielle. Uh, Mohammed, I don't know about you, but uh, if you feel OK to share, you can send me the slides and I will make them into a PDF and we will post the recording on YouTube as well. OK, 
Thank you very much. So much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.